Narborough is an extremely safe village in Leicestershire, England. It is known for one crime and one crime only. It took place in 1983. Fifteen-year-old Linda Mann lived in Narborough. She attended Lutterworth Grammar School and Community College. She was the younger sister of Susan Mann, who was two years her senior. Their mother was Kathleen Mann, who moved to Narborough after her marriage ended. Kathleen married Edward Eastwood in 1980 when Susan was 14 and Linda was 12. Linda was described as a typical teenager. She was quiet, but popular. She liked school and enjoyed being with friends. Linda had little trouble with adolescence. An adventurous girl, she liked everything about growing up, music, hairstyles, makeup, and clothes. If money for clothes was a bit short, Linda would babysit to earn money and make her own dresses. On November 21st of 1983, Linda walked to a friend's house, but never made it there. She promised Kathleen and Edward that she would be home by 10 p.m. By midnight, Linda was still not home. Her frantic parents called the police. They searched all night for her. A hospital porter discovered her body at 7.20 a.m. as he was on his way to work. He initially thought it was a mannequin. Linda had been assaulted and strangled. Her jeans were removed and the rest of her clothes were strewn about. She had a scarf around her neck. The scarf was used to strangle her. When people in Narborough heard about the crime, they were absolutely horrified. Young girls were encouraged to walk in groups from then on. Investigators searched the immediate area around the crime scene, but were not able to find anything useful. Only a few hundred yards away from the crime scene, there was a local psychiatric hospital. Some people believed that the perpetrator could be a patient at the hospital, but no evidence of this was found. During the autopsy, male DNA was collected from Linda's body. The individual had type A blood. This meant about 10% of the adult male population in England could be responsible. Edward's blood was taken and it was found he was not the same 10% blood group as the slayer of Linda. A group of investigators walked from house to house to see if they could gather any information. Other investigators made a list of all offenders of similar crimes in Leicestershire and went about questioning them all. Investigators received a call about a spiky-haired youth. The person on the phone claimed to have seen him at about 8 p.m., about two minutes away from where Linda's body was found. Unfortunately, he was never identified. For three long years, investigators tried to find the perpetrator. It was then, in 1986, that tragedy struck again. 15-year-old Dawn Ashworth lived in Enderby, Leicestershire with her parents and her brother Andrew. She was gifted at drawing. She had a part-time job working at the newsagent shop in Enderby. On July 31st of 1986, Dawn left work at 4 p.m. and headed to her friend's house in Narborough. She was told to be home by 7 p.m. Dawn was last seen at 4.40 p.m. by passing motorists passing King Edward Avenue. By 7.30 p.m., with no sign of Dawn, her parents got concerned. They drove through Narborough and they couldn't find her. At 9.40 p.m., they called the police. They could not help but think of Linda Mann and hoping their daughter did not suffer a similar fate. A few days later, police officers searching for Dawn found her body in a field beside Ten Pound Lane. She had been assaulted and strangled. Male DNA collected from Dawn's body revealed the attacker had the same blood type as the man that slayed Linda Mann. This was not the only similarity. Both crimes took place on footpaths. Both girls were teenagers and both walking alone. They were both found in similar circumstances having suffered the same fate. Linda and Dawn both attended Lutterworth Grammar School and Community College. 
At the foot of 10 Pound Lane, the police parked a mobile incident room to take information from villagers and passers-by. The police took about 200 telephone calls and dozens of people visited the mobile unit. The most promising new lead concerned a motorcycle that had been parked under the motorway bridge. There were several reports of a young man in a red crash helmet observed in the vicinity sometime around 5 p.m. on the day of the crime. On August 1st, the day after Dawn was reported missing, but a day before her body was found, a policewoman and a detective saw a youth on a red motorcycle and a red crash helmet take an interest in the search. A police constable on security duty was approached by a 17-year-old kitchen porter from Carlton Hayes Hospital. It is the psychiatric hospital close to where both Linda and Dawn's bodies were found. The kitchen porter told the constable that he saw Dawn walking on the day she disappeared. The constable arranged that they talk to him later again to find out some more information. Before they could talk to him again, valuable information was given to the incident room. The information came from the kitchen porter's friend who also worked at the Carlton Hayes Hospital. This friend had been on holiday the day Don went missing, but he had gone to the hospital to collect his wages. The kitchen porter visited him at 10 p.m. and excitedly told him that Don's body had been found in a hedge near a gate by the M1 bridge. The friend's father overheard the conversation and asked the kitchen porter where he had gotten his information because nothing about Dawn's case had been on the television. Someone told me, the kitchen porter said mysteriously. Her body was hanging from a tree. Dawn's body wasn't hanging from a tree, but she was concealed beneath tree limbs and other debris. She was found inside an access gate leading from 10 Pound Lane to the fields. It was just a 10 minute walk from the M1 bridge. How did the kitchen porter have all the information about where Dawn's body was more than 12 hours before police found her body? After investigators learned all of this information, they went to his house to arrest him. The kitchen porter is Richard Buckland. Buckland was then driven to Wigston police station so he could be interrogated further. Buckland gave inconsistent statements to investigators, but did admit that he saw Dawn on the day she disappeared and that he did talk to her. Through his rambles, he at one point confessed to everything and then quickly took it all back. During the third interview with him, Buckland gave a detailed confession. He was able to give so many facts about the crime scene that were not public at the time. Before Richard Buckland went on trial, Dawn Ashworth was buried. Four weeks after she was taken from a village footpath, she was buried in a little cemetery behind St. John Baptist Church in Enderby. The vicar described her as a bright, lively, charming young lady, obedient to her parents, loyal to her family, and full of the joy of life. 200 people showed up at the cemetery behind the stone church to bid farewell to Dawn. Investigators were still building up their case against Richard Buckland and heard about something called DNA testing. They were already convinced that he took Dawn's life and probably Linda Mann's as well, but they figured they could try this new technology. All the DNA evidence from both crime scenes were sent to a young geneticist. He worked at Leicestershire University and claimed to have come up with a wondrous new discovery called genetic fingerprinting. The geneticist was Dr. Alec Jeffries. Dr. Jeffries was not sure how he could do what investigators wanted him to do. This sort of analysis had never been done before. Dr. Jeffries first used his technique to resolve an immigration case and after that a paternity dispute. This would be the first time that this new technology would be used in a criminal case to reveal the identity of a perpetrator. To everyone's surprise, when the DNA tests came back, it showed that Buckland was innocent and did not take Linda's life. Even more surprising, he did not take Dawn's life either. Dr. Jeffrey's tests, however, were able to determine that investigators did at least get one thing right. It was the same man responsible for both crimes. Richard Buckland was then released and became the first person to be exonerated through the use of DNA profiling. 
Inspector Derek Pierce then took charge of the investigation. Pierce read 1,800 messages that came from the public. One of the messages pertained to a man whose name had popped up on the Linda Mann inquiry because he was unalibied and had a prior record for flashing. Of course, hundreds of names had been called in anonymously by wives, lovers, rivals, neighbors, and many of those names belonging to people with prior indecency arrests. This one wasn't worth special attention because in the earlier inquiry, he had been shown not to have moved to the village until one month after Linda's slaying. The message about him that the police received read, You ought to have a look at a man in Littlethorpe named Colin Pitchfork. With there being so many unalibied men in the area, investigators came up with a new idea. They started to see what DNA could do, and decided that every unalibied male resident in the villages between ages of 17 and 34 years old would be asked to submit blood and saliva samples voluntarily. It was announced to the public on the 2nd of January 1987. Derek Pierce didn't believe the perpetrator was going to simply volunteer. He said, we just hope it might somehow flush him out. By the end of January, a thousand men had taken the tests and only a quarter of that number had been cleared. The forensic laboratory was swamped, and it seemed certain that the testing was going to take longer than the early estimation of two months. By May, 3,653 men had taken the tests, yet only 2,000 had been eliminated, due to the workload under which the laboratory technicians labored. Then, on September 18th of 1987, the police received a call that they had been waiting for. A woman called and said she heard a concerning conversation take place between a group of friends in the Clarendon pub in Leicester. One of the men, Ian Kelly talked out loud about how he took the blood test for the investigation on behalf of a friend, Colin Pitchfork. Investigators looked into Pitchfork's file and saw his history of flashing women. They also saw that his signature from when they did house calls did not match the signature that he made or gave on the day he supposedly took the blood test. He was married to Carol Pitchfork. He worked at a bakery and Pitchfork was known as a womanizer and had a string of affairs. On September 19th of 1987, Derek Pierce went to Ian Kelly's house to ask him some questions. Ian was also a baker, and he worked with Colin Pitchfork. Ian at first denied taking Pitchfork's blood test, but then admitted it. Ian told Pierce what Pitchfork had told him, Pitchfork said that he was worried the police would assume he was responsible for what happened to Linda and Dawn based on his history of flashing. Pitchfork was a master manipulator and convinced Ian to go to the incident room and take the blood test on his behalf. Later that day, a group of investigators went to Pitchfork's house. Detective Mick Thomas gave it to him straight. From inquiries that we have made, we believe you're responsible for taking Don Ashworth's life on the 31st of July, 1986. We believe another man gave a blood sample for you. I am arresting you. Do you understand? Colin Pitchfork didn't deny it. His face said it all. He knew he had been caught. He even explained that he entered a photo of Ian Kelly in his passport so investigators would not suspect anything. When Carol Pitchfork entered the room, it was explained to her what was going on. She immediately started kicking and punching her husband. Understandably, investigators were slow to stop her. At the police station, Pitchfork first explained what he did to Linda Mann. He said that he planned on flashing her, but it turned into more when he realized she would recognize him one day. After he committed the crime, Pitchfork went back to his car where his and Carol's baby was tied up in his seat and went home. Pitchfork then told investigators what he did to Don Ashworth. Both crimes happened the exact same way. He told investigators that he knew what he was doing but could not stop himself from doing those things. Pitchfork also said that he tried to take Ian Kelly's life a few times to make sure he never talked, but his plans always failed. On January 22nd of 1988, 28-year-old Colin Pitchfork went on trial at the Crown Court in Leicester. Firstly, 
Ian Kelly was given an 18-month prison sentence suspended for two years, which meant he would not have to serve time. When Ian stepped out of the courtroom, he faced the media. I was wrong for doing what I did. I am sorry for whoever I caused grievance to. Colin Pitchfork was dressed in summer clothes, jeans and a short-sleeved shirt. He pleaded guilty to taking the lives of both Linda Mann and Don Ashworth. He received a double life sentence for his crimes. Much to the astonishment of investigators, the judge did not give a recommendation for a minimum term. Without such a recommendation, the life sentence in Britain was similar to that in the United States, which meant that Colin Pitchfork could conceivably be released in 10 or 12 years. The police were outraged. Linda Mann's stepfather, Eddie Eastwood, said, Pitchfork looked at me, eye to eye. He just stared at me as if to say, well, what's the matter with you? I could not make him out. He looked almost human. Linda's mother, Kathleen, said, it was the shock of seeing him. I did not look up when the lawyer passed those photos of Linda to the bench. Those photos of how she looked when they found her, the cover dropped open and the audience gasped when they saw the photos. My brother saw them and cried. Luckily, I did not look up. He must never be allowed to walk the streets again. He should hang. With this new DNA genetic fingerprint, there is no chance of a person being later proved innocent after he has been hanged. There is no excuse anymore. When all the dust settled, investigators still faced the question of why Richard Buckland knew so many details of the crime scene of Dawn Ashworth. They believe that he stumbled upon her body on his way to work. He has often been described as the village idiot, and it is believed that played a part in why he confessed. The cases of Linda Mann and Don Ashworth are seen as a big reason why DNA technology has advanced so much. Today, thousands of cold cases have been solved thanks to Dr. Alec Jeffries.